This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by Sound Porter Mastering, Adam Audio, OWC, Jay-Z Microphones, Spectra 1964, and Isotope. In fact, you're hearing my voice right now on the Jay-Z BB-29 microphone through the Spectra 1964 STX100 Mic Pre, C610 Comp Limiter, and Isotope RX and Ozone. So get ready to rock! When I was more in demand for mixing, that's when my recording style also changed because I started to recognize where the missed opportunities were, even in the recording stage. I'll always be thinking when somebody would send me some tracks to mix, I would go like, damn, why didn't they set this extra microphone? And they could have. Very often they had the resources, but probably didn't have the imagination. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. I'm Brian Murphy, and I strive to produce masters that move your song emotionally, but maintain the spirit of your mix and the intention of the artist. My promise is to give your music its best sonic performance, not simply change it. You work hard on your mix, and I always want to respect that. My goal is to help you realize how great your mix can be, and I'll work hard to make sure it succeeds. I don't just master, I help your mix sound the best it can. Contact me for a free mastering demo at soundporter.com. I've got two words for you that will help you make your best record ever and not lose it. Storage and backup. You want fast drives for composing and recording and reliable drives for backup so you don't lose all your hard work when something goes wrong. That's why I chose OWC Mercury Extreme Pro 6G internal SSDs for my studio computer and Mercury Elite Pro external drives for archiving. Discover the best OWC drive options for your studio at maxsales.com slash rock stars. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Sean. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Rafa Sardina, a recording and mixing engineer with five Grammy wins, 12 Latin Grammy awards, and a total of 60 Grammy nominations all told during his career, including winning the South African Sama Award in 2018. A Basque native of Spain, Rafa started out with four years in med school before finally deciding to pursue his passion for music, which brought him over to the U.S. and led him to Full Sail University. After graduating as valedictorian, He found himself at Ocean Way in Los Angeles, working with a wide variety of artists, including the Black Crows, Celine Dion, Green Day, Madonna, the Rolling Stones, Red Hot Chili Peppers, and Frank Sinatra, to name just a few. And today, he works from his own after-hours studios, where he regularly mixes artists from all around the world. Though Rafa is best known for working on pop, rock, and R&B projects, he has recorded and mixed just about any genre of music you can imagine, orchestral recordings, big band, R&B, dance, gospel, soul, rap, choral, film, TV soundtracks, and huge movie scores like Any Given Sunday, 102 Dalmatians, Michael Jordan to the Max, and Johnny Depp's The Rum Diary, and many, many more. He's also a founding member and vice chairman of the Latin Recording Academy's CPI, the equivalent to the producers and engineers wing of the Recording Academy. And Rafa enjoys teaching what he knows and has learned through platforms like Mix with the Masters, Pensado's Place, and of course, lucky for us, Recording Studio Rockstars. So I'm really excited to have Rafa joining us today. He's got an incredible list of um, artists that he's worked with over the years. And a big thank you also to Andres Evelis over at Jay-Z Microphones for making our introduction. Please welcome Rafa Sardina to Recording Studio Rockstars. Rafa, my friend, are you ready to rock? I'm ready to rock. All right, dude. Great <laughs> to have you here. You know, I realized that as I um, composed your intro, I really didn't talk about some of your um, credits that you've done, you know, after the time at, at Ocean Way, and you've worked with so many great artists, um, you know, short of just creating an instant list of all the people you worked with, who are some of the favorites that you've been uh, working with recently that you're really excited about? 
Well, uh, I, I have actually been very excited to work with new artists or relatively unknown artists other than, you know, the bigger artists uh, have the pleasure to work with over the years, you know. I, I was very lucky to be able to work with, uh, in the camp, uh, Michael Jackson's camp with Stevie Wonder, uh, Lady wow. Gaga, Elvis Costello, Placido, Placido Domingo, those type of characters. But uh, I really, really enjoy working with new talent or talent that's not that, you know, uh, known yet. Like Flor de Toloache, I produced um, their last album. And we actually even did some great collaborations with John Legend and uh, Cultura Profetica, a reggae band from Puerto Rico, very well known. Um, so, yeah, I, I really enjoy working with all kinds of people, all kinds of music. That has been my my main drive over the years to to really stay eclectic. Yeah. I mean, one of the artists that I included in a playlist, uh, rock stars that we put together for you in the show notes, is even D'Angelo. Um, that was a record that I believe you guys won a Grammy for, right? We Yeah, actually won the Grammy for Best R&B Album. And he was nominated for Record of the Year. With the, that, the one song uh, uh, I sent, I sent to you, yeah, that's fantastic. Black Messiah, that was the name of that album. Yes, exactly. Yeah, Black um, Messiah. Great stuff. Well, we're really glad to have you here on the show, and I've uh, done my best to introduce you. But if you don't mind, in your own words, um, give us kind of a brief synopsis of how you got started into in, into music and got to this point where you've got a beautiful studio now, and you've um, you know had sixty Grammy nominations. Well, first of all, I'm a music lover. That's the first thing that um, I will mention. Uh, and I stay a music lover. I love uh, making music uh, from every angle and every aspect. First of all, I consider myself a musician. That's how I started when I was only a kid. And that that was what I aspired to do, not really to become an engineer or producer because I didn't I didn't even know what that was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll read the credits and see like, oh, somebody produced. What does it truly mean? I, I really didn't know. But I had a sense of what it could mean, but didn't know for sure what, what was the task at hand, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I mainly, you know, grew up as a musician. I really love music. I love to rehearse. I love to to play. And I guess that uh, before I could ever achieve any success as a musician, uh, I really discovered the other side of making music, which is production and engineering. And it, it, it really attracted me so heavily. It was, it was such an attraction that that's what I pursued for the following, um, let's say, five years. I really discovered a recording studio when I was 15. 15, 16 wow. years old, and I had that full, full on experience of recording a full album with a band I was I was with. Um, I used to go to every re rehearsal they would do. My cousin was the drummer in that band. They were actually fantastic. Nothing came out of, came out of it, but the experience was totally fantastic. And and yes. It, in the in the meantime, actually, my family moved to the U.S. and moved. They were actually living in between the U.S. and Mexico, and that allowed me to come to the U.S. Uh, on and off. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, I went through four years of medical school, like you mentioned, and I never finished. <laughs> yeah, wow. because I gave everything up to just work on music exclusively. That's so intense going to four years of medical school. I mean, it's it's a little funny. Um, there are some analogies. Um, uh, Billy Decker, who's been on the show, he yeah. completely mm -hmm. went through and got his um, his uh, it was a law degree, I believe, before he decided to go into music. And I went through four years of architecture before I <laughs> decided to go to music. I don't know what it was about our generation, you know, finishing the wrong, completely finishing the wrong schooling before finally deciding to go to school. <laughs> maybe, maybe schooling was sort of a new thing back then for us too. I mean, you know, that you went to, I believe you went to Full Sail about this in 91, about the same time I moved to go to a Middle Tennessee State University. And I had the impression that this was kind of a new thing to have a recording school. Maybe that's just because I was of that age, but I don't know if you have any, th any thoughts about that. Yeah, it was new for me too, because up to that point, I was self-taught. Uh, everything I knew, and I had recorded 
quite a few albums uh, when I attended uh, Full Cell. Uh, and I had been on tour. I had been a front of house engineer, monitor engineer, tour manager, <laughs> stage manager, you name it. Um, and I even work on big productions, you know, like um, as the, the support team, you know, for the production uh, of the shows. So I, I understood a little bit of every aspect of um, putting a show together or recording an album and all of that. But I had no schooling about it. And that's why I decided at some point when I decided to really take it seriously and give it a try, like a real try to 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 make it a livelihood, um, that's, that's how I decided to get some schooling. And it really helped uh, in the sense that even though I had quite a bit of experience, it, it helped me connect the dots. It helped yeah. me connect the dots of things that I was already doing or mimicking from other engineers, other producers, but I didn't know where it where it actually came from originally. I didn't know the uh, the real reason why I was using some specific techniques. So it really helped me put two and two together and and actually progress, you know, and being more, uh, let's say, having a different level of uh, expansion in the way I imagined, you know, uh, doing things it expanded my view on on engineering well you had an advantage of having an older cousin it sounds like who was already in a band so you had that initial exposure to what something might look like i mean were you studying guitar yourself yes i was studying guitar and by the way my cousin was only a month older than me okay so (laughs) he was he was super super young (laughs) when we went in the studio. I mean, we have some amazing pictures and we were just kids. We, we were just kids. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Well, so um, you did the uh, full sale thing and then you did quite well with that. And I remember hearing, uh, reading somewhere a story of you going to, it sounded like you went to Los Angeles for like 24 hours or something. And somehow you you hit all the studios to interview and find a job opportunity or an internship opportunity. Is there a story you want to share about that? Oh yeah, that was that was quite a stressful <laughs> trip that I took. <laughs> you know, I only had I, I didn't have that many resources or anything, so I really tried to lock as many interviews as I could for a very specific date. Um, I remember it was like a January or February, and uh, what are the odds that day it was pouring in LA? It was oh, raining yeah. like nobody's business. And I which remember, never happens if you which don't know. It never happens. That. It's true. It never happens. So I arrived in LA and I only had 24 hours to interview. And I did so many, I, I did basically three main interviews. Those were the record plant, Westlake Pro Studios, Westlake Studios, and Ocean Way Recording, which was truly the place where I wanted to land. And mm-hmm. And yeah, I did everything in the same day. It was like super stressful. I didn't have any more time to rearrange any further meetings or anything else. So I took that last meeting at Ocean Way and they gave me actually quite positive prospects in the other two studios. But as I'm telling you, I really wanted, I was locked into trying to get at Ocean Way. And and I was obsessed about the place and the kind of clientele they were working with. I mean, they did so many rock projects mm-hmm. and all all types of projects, orchestral projects. And I was reading uh, about them in Mix Magazine all the time. And so I went to to have the interview with the general manager, Jack Waltz, and and I had a quite a nice interview. He was quite quite a gent quite a gentleman about it. And At the end of the interview, he basically told me that I didn't have enough experience to be part of the team and that he didn't see how I could fit in. Uh, Let's keep in mind that back then the studio was hiring seasoned engineers to become assistant engineers. So it wasn't like they were hiring, you know, that many, uh, let's say, startup, you know, assistants or uh, they hire runners, but most of the runners uh, 
will be there for a minimum of three years to become assistant engineer. Wow. So wow. it was quite uh, it was quite a long wait, and I understood it. And I proposed myself as a as the new up and coming assistant engineer, and he didn't buy it <laughs> right away. <laughs> and <laughs> And I remember he he basically told me the interview was over. I left the studio and I knocked back in and I went back in that room. And I told Jack, do you know what? We're both missing. We're going to miss on an amazing opportunity. Both of us, if we don't do this, please hire me. Find a way to hire me. And that's how I became an intern at the studio. I think I was one of the first, if not the first intern at the studio and he's like, okay, the only way I can see this happening is you becoming an intern with no obligations from my part. You have to really show me uh, what you are made of. And and that's how I started my career in LA. Well, that's great. And then um, do you remember, you know, struggling with the, how am I going to pay for my bills and all that during my internship? Oh. Or did you just find a couch to sleep on? Absolutely. That was the struggle. That was that was the real struggle. But it didn't last too long because soon enough, uh, he actually came to me and said, like, do you know what? I think that you do deserve uh, being paid. And uh, obviously it was minimum wage, but very low pay. But he said, like, I see that you could definitely fit in in our structure. And yeah, I want to... Yeah, I want you to be, you know, comfortable enough. I was still struggling <laughs> for a good year, yeah. but at least, you know, he he reached out and he gave me the opportunity. Yeah, that stuff's so much fun. I mean, my first internship was at a place called Woodland Studios here in Nashville. And then, you know, I found another studio I could kind of intern slash assistant at. And those first chances to be in the studio, they're just so great. No, it's absolutely. So much fun. And those are great memories, yeah. Do you want to know how I get a consistent sound quality mixing hundreds of episodes of recording studio rock stars? Well, I've been cheating all along by using Isotope RX and Ozone on every single episode. Right now, you are hearing RX D-Click, D-Clip, D-S, D-Plosive, Voice D-Noise, Ozone Multiband Compression, EQ, and Limiting on my voice. If you want great, consistent mixes too, go to isotope.com slash rockstars and use the code ROCK10 to get an additional 10% off. The secret to great sounding bass in your mix is to start with a great recording. If you've got an awesome part, player, and instrument, then all you need next is to plug that into the BBDI passive direct box from Spectra 1964 through the C610 comp limiter, and you've got an incredible bass tone that goes all the way down. The BBDI is the best sounding bass DI I have ever used. It'll move your pant leg. No hype, no color, just pure tone at spectra1964.com. What are some things you remember about Ocean Way? Um, I've been there. I've seen Jack Joseph Puig's room, and that's about mm-hmm. it. That's kind of all I've seen of Ocean Way in my experience. How would you describe it? How many studios were there? And was he in that room as early as 91, or was it not till the late 90s that he started to have a room there? Uh, it was still the late 90s uh, because he was, Jack was actually going from room to room every few months. So he will be camping in a studio two for maybe two, four months. Then he will, he will move to studio three. Then he will move to studio A in the other building, what's now United Recording Studios. So basically the studios were comprised of the two buildings and a third building in uh, Sherman Oaks. Uh, and the two buildings in LA, in Hollywood, were what's now the United Recording Studios with the two big rooms, Studio A and Studio B, and now they have another mix room, which where actually Jack Joseph also camped for years mixing in that room exclusively. I think they call it the Studio D. And then the other building had Studios 1, 2, and 3, and then an additional studio um, that was called the Yamaha Room because it was originally a piano demonstration room for Yamaha pianos, and then it become a reco- became a recording studio. And they, then they built an additional studio, um, which was taken by another producer engineer for many years. So, And then the two rooms, uh, Record One Studios in, in Sherman Oaks, which they 
reconditioned for Quincy Jones and for Michael Jackson. So that was basically it. And in the later years, they they opened the Nashville op- operation. So did you have an opportunity to work with Quincy and, and Michael? Oh, yes, I did. I did. I did uh, have an opportunity to work with them, but separately. I never worked with Quincy and Michael in the same room because when I worked with Michael, it was in the later years when they were not actually collaborating together anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay. What were some uh, memories or takeaways for you of those experiences of working with Quincy first? You know, what what was something that you learned from him? Oh, you learned so much. Uh, about the human factor. You learn so much about relationships, about how to honey relationships, uh, about how to treat people, how to um, be in control of the flow of, of a session, even though the flow of a session is something so unpredictable, you can at least um, predict your possibilities <laughs> during during yeah. the day, how things are going to pan out and what you need to do if things don't go the way you you expect, uh, you learn a lot about that aspect, m- even more than the even musical aspect or the technical aspect of things. Yeah, I feel like that was one of the first lessons I remember learning from some of my mentors was that um, you, you begin to, I think at first you you discover things don't go the way you expect and then you think you're doing something's wrong, right? Your first first times in the studio. And then you exactly. learn. <laughs> then you begin to learn that things always don't go the way you expect, and and the people who are quite great at this don't ever seem to let it derail them. Exactly, and I, I, actually, I will even say that uh, most times things shouldn't go the way you expect them to go, because uh, that's the beauty of what we do. Uh, it's something very creative, very. A uh, subjective, uh, something that can, you know, uh, it's in constant transformation. So you have to learn to feel comfortable about that. And one of the struggles when I was beginning, when I was a beginner, was not understanding that aspect, not fully understanding that as- that aspect, and expecting for things to be a little bit more under control, and. Uh, not feeling 100% comfortable about uh, sudden changes uh, Mm -hmm. during a session. And early on, I learned to toss all of that, trust all of that, you know, all of those, you know, that personal concept I had and just go with the flow. And yeah, expect the unexpected. Yeah. Um, What was the lesson that you learned from Michael? Well, he was so prepared. He was always so prepared, um, personally prepared. Uh, he liked to experiment in terms of the music and with other people, but in terms of his own personal performance, he was a real pro. He was like always like super prepared. He would warm up for up to three hours wow. before even getting to the mic. It was just like a whole a ritual that he followed and... When he when he got to the mic, he was just two hundred percent there. It was just unbelievable. It truly was unbelievable. Um, those are like really really fond memories for me because uh, I was able to witness, you know, that excellence. You know, somebody like trying to reach out for excellence, and I experienced that with so many other people. And they don't need to be organized or tidy about their. Um, personal rituals or the way mm-hmm. they do things, but they simply, you know, when they saw you that they can excel at what they do in, in such an unpredictable way, uh, that's when you go like, wow, I'm in the right business. I mean, it, it's one of those experiences is super, super fulfilling. And so, uh, of course, we're, we're wondering, did that give you three hours to get the mic ready for Michael? <laughs> no, not really, not really. <laughs> Uh, that was like a personal um, thing that he did, but meanwhile, we'll be working on something else. We're yeah. always working on something, working on the music, uh, whatever was required. Yeah. Um, well, I think of it like a uh, you know a, an elite sports athlete preparing for something. I mean, you know, you have to be incredibly focused, and when when it's time for the race to start, you know, you can't sort of start walking at the beginning. You got to jump right in and nail it. Um, and then, of course, what we want to know is the mic that you 
<laughs> set up for Michael when he stepped up to it. Was it a sure SMB? SM7B, excuse me. That was one of the Macs that he used, but if I'm not mistaken, he also used a C12, a tube C12 in some occasions. And I'm actually pretty sure it was a C12 uh, in quite a few occasions, yeah. But yeah, the SM7 was always ready for him to use. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, we love that mic because most of us can probably afford to get that mic, you know. Absolutely. It's one of my favorite microphones, I have to say, <laughs> and super versatile. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, would you agree that that's a mic that is versatile f across a male or a female vocal as well? Yes, I have had very good experiences, you know, um, yeah, with both male and female. And even for other, other uses, even for drum, uh, using them for as a room for drums or, I mean, for a bass cabinet and for electric guitars. Um, I mean, you name it. I mean, it, it sounds great on so many things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, as I mentioned in the beginning, I wanted to give a thank you to Andrus over at Jay-Z Microphones for introducing us. Um, they make a bunch of cool mics that I enjoy using in my studio. Have you had a chance to use any of theirs, or are there any ones that you um, have found particularly useful on a certain instrument? Oh, absolutely. I use them all the time. I have quite a bunch of them. Uh, if not, no, I won't say I have all of them, but most of them. And yes, I use them even for acoustic guitars. I use them for vocals. I mean, uh, I love the V series. I mean, yeah. they, they have really, really fantastic stuff. Yeah, uh, and it's and it's a more let's say modern concept in terms of uh, it's hard to describe you know, in terms of the texture uh, textures that it allows you to capture. That's what I love about them that they were not stuck up with, you know, with the old ways of making things sound in a very specific, mellow kind of way. Mm -hmm. No, they, they they had their own vision. Yeah. Yeah, they have an incredible amount of detail. Um, one of the mics, um, this the V11 is the, the Vintage 11 mic. I don't know if it's modeled after a particular style of microphone initially, but it's the closest one that, that, that I would describe as being almost like a ribbon if it was a condenser because it's sort of dark compared to the others. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, But the thing I really loved about it that I discovered sort of by accident is it captures an enormous amount of low end, like the the sl the, the deep resonance of a drum kit. Um, it really picks that stuff up. Yeah, and I actually use them for that too, for as a, even a room or a, you know, a, I drop it even in the back, you know, in the back of, of the drummer, of the mm -hmm. player, once in a while, you know, pointing down and it, it actually captures that thump from the drums yeah yeah it's like it picks up the sustain of the low end that, that yeah. happens a moment later or something um very cool um well let's see tell us about your studio so you have a beautiful studio um after hours studios that you mix from regularly tell us about your studio is that where you're joining us from now or is that where you go to when you're um, just when you're going to work and are you home now yeah, that's actually where I'm, I am right now. <laughs> okay, great. I'm, I'm at the studio. Uh, and this is my personal uh, home studio. I also co-own other studios in town, but this is my own personal space. And it is a mixed room uh, most of the time, but it's also a tracking room. I can actually track drums and even a full band here. Uh, the space is limited, but enough to get really great sounds. So... I have had this space for about 18 years now, and it grew. It grew with me, you know. It grew from being a, a space with a, just a controller and a few pieces of gear to now having a full rack of outboard gear, and an SSL duality board and big monitors and and all of that. Not that I need all of it to make records, because obviously we can make records with whatever we have at hand. That's the reality. But it has been sort of like my fantasy land in a way, right? Mm -hmm. Where I, I have everything that I could ever need, you know, available for me to use. Um, and is the duality, is that the digital SSL? It's actually an analog SSL. Oh, it's uh, an analog, okay. It's an analog board, but they actually call it duality because it's also a controller. So it has a second layer. You press a switch and it switches into a a digital controller mode. So some of the switches on the board are just, um, you know, controllers where you can control uh, Pro Tools or Logic or whatever you might be using. 
Oh, very cool. Does that include things like sends and EQs and, and mutes and all that? Uh, it includes basically, you have to map things out, but uh, since it's in the Hue, Huey protocol, mm -hmm. it, it only controls a limited amount of things, uh, but enough you know, to control, like you are saying, sends and and obviously faders, uh, pan pods and sends and whatnot. So, so that's something that you've found to be very helpful when you're mixing is that having that tactile ability to still yes. use a console. Yes, absolutely. I'm very tactile, you know, with uh, when I'm mixing because it is more spontaneous. You can just grab a fader and just do it. Go yeah. for it. You don't have to think as much about what you're doing. You're just, uh, ex you know, uh, just doing it. Yeah, I feel like using a mouse... Um, I love being able to do all those things in the computer by using a mouse on a screen, but somehow it triggers a part of my brain that it's that's like a little pause there. It's like a glitch in the matrix when I'm mixing. You know? Yes, <laughs> that I, you describe it perfectly. That's how it feels like a glitch in the matrix, yeah. because yes, we are uh, you know we're using our intuition when we're mixing, and every time you are forced to uh, to grab the mouse or do something. Um, that's being so focused on the monitor and all of that, uh, it triggers a different part of your brain and you get out of the moment. Yes, it's. I totally agree. That's why I love to mix, you know, with some kind of controller, something that allows me to grab a fader or grab a pan pot and automate that way. And then if I need to fine tune what I have executed, I can do it with the mouse. If I'm missing like this syllable or I'm, uh, something didn't quite, you know, it happened, you know, perfectly in the downbeat uh, of a note or something like that, then I can actually go to the mouse, grab my mouse and, and perfect it. Um, I've tried to describe what that feels like to somebody else who may not, you know, if, if I'm trying to explain to somebody who doesn't do this, I would say, imagine if you had to play a guitar but you couldn't just hold the guitar in your hands and you had to use the tip of a pencil to do every single thing that you need to do on a guitar. That's what it feels like to me mixing with the mouse. <laughs> exactly. Or playing a sport where you cannot actually kick the ball. You have to, yeah, with 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 a mouse or with a pencil, click on a spot so, it, you know, the, the avatar kicks the ball. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you just need a mic that will stand out in a mix. That's when you need the new BB29 Signature Series from Jay-Z Microphones. The unique single diaphragm golden drop capsule gives the BB29 airy highs and smooth mid-range to help your tracks stand at the front of your mix. Jay-Z's handcrafted, fully discreet microphones come with a five-year warranty and free shipping to the U.S. You're hearing my voice on the BB29 right now. Use the limited time coupon ROCKSTARS to get 50% off the BB29 at jzmike.com. Well, so let's see. Um, you've got the console in front of you. You do have an incredible rack of gear. When I see the photos, it's it's like, I mean, you, you're sort of um, humble about it, but it's really more like a wall of gear behind you in the photo. And then um, what about, uh, what is what is some of the gear that goes back there that you find really useful? Um, and then, what about monitoring? How important is are the speakers that you choose and that sort of thing? Actually, uh, my space and the monitor are the most important aspect of the whole studio. That's why um, when I moved from my previous house and I thought about building a new home studio, because I had another one previously, um, I really wanted to dedicate a lot of my resources to really getting it right in terms of the acoustics of the space and the monitoring. Obviously, you can always get lucky and go to an, an space that's not um, treated and really get lucky. And it sounds great. It could sound great, but I really didn't want to take any chances because I was planning on staying in this place for quite a long time. This was the house where I wanted to to be, you know, to stay and live and and yeah, I, I wanted to get the monitoring right, the acoustics right, uh, uh, having enough isolation so I wouldn't bother anybody if I was doing any tracking session. Mm -hmm. It's amazing, but you could be playing the monitors like super, super loud and manage to not get too much spill out of the building. But it's a different story if you have a 
hard hitting drummer playing drums. It's amazing the kind of SPL that a drummer can generate. Yes. And an experience that even in my previous space, uh, you know, working with some drummers, you know, like Vinny or or Greg Bissonette or those guys, you know, when they're really hitting hard, you know, in a rock song or something that has, you know, requires all of, you know, guts and and sound pressure, you could actually hear everything outdoors, absolutely everything. It almost seemed like they were out outside <laughs> and it actually became a problem in my previous studio. I had to yeah. really do something about it. That's why I also got a lot of isolation for uh, for my ISO booth. Well, yeah. there's there's only one solution. You just, you, you, well, there's two. You either buy the houses on either side of your house or you <laughs> just make sure that your neighbors love drums. Yeah, absolutely. One of the two or, <laughs> or none of them and you get kicked out. <laughs> but yeah. yeah <laughs> Well, very cool. Well, so, um, you know, I'll jump to another story here that I heard you talking about. You were you were mentioning Quincy Jones being ready for anything, um, and you have to be able to pivot, and that was one of the lessons you learned. Uh, tell us about this story. Uh, you were at R- Criteria Studios doing a record with Vinny Caliuta, and, uh, and I believe he showed up a little ear- earlier than you expected for the session. Do you remember that one, that story? Oh yeah, that, uh, I remember that record very well because um, that was exactly 18 years ago, and I do remember because my son was five months old, and he was actually in Miami with me uh, for that record, and that was a session, a project that took me to Miami for five months approximately, and. And I remember we did a lot of pre-production planning on the project, how we were going to approach things. We had a lot of musicians that were going to be playing in in the album. And last, very last minute, as we're doing our first day of pre, like really heavy duty pre-production at Criteria, uh, we get a message telling us that we needed to record Vinny now or he wouldn't be available. And he was booked for two or three days later. I think it was three days later. And that same evening, I had to just get things together, like, okay, how are we going to do this? Do you know how? And we even had to rent, we had to rent a, a drum set. Um, oh, wow, you didn't even have drums with him, yeah. No, he didn't, because the plans changed and he, he wasn't going to be available. So they didn't have time to to send, you know, his stuff via Carthage. And we had to rent some drums. And I do remember even the drums were wrong. And <laughs> that evening with Vinny, you know, uh, you know, working together, him and me trying to make it happen. I do remember that he was he was just swearing and going like, oh my God, how are we going to do this? This is not right. This is not right. This tom is crap. This is not going to work. So we had to actually rent additional drums to make it happen. And yeah, and we... We managed to put everything together and the song that, um, the first song that we ever recorded together in that, at Criteria, we had worked before in the past, but that first song for that album was the most iconic, you know, opening song of the, uh, the most iconic song of the project. It was the opening song. It's called No Es Lo Mismo for Alejandro Sanz. And everybody asked me afterwards, you know, even years later, how do you get that drum sound? How is it? <laughs> and I always thought like, if they knew. <laughs> it was such an improvised, you know, fit. We had to just take whatever we had and do with whatever we had and improvise, even the acoustics of the room. I remember... It was in in the biggest studio, Studio A at, at Criteria, which is a huge tracking room, and and I had to use I don't know how many, but I had to blanket most of the studio and use gobos around Vinny and move them around, have people moving them around for in order for me to get the width that I was looking for and you know and the sound that I was looking for because it required quite a tight sound and mm-hmm. the room was so huge. Um, and yeah, it, it was all improvised. I think that some of the best recordings come come out of those types of experiences when you don't have time to really think. It's just like do uh, mm-hmm. and use your bare instinct to to make things happen. 
Yeah, you you hear a problem, you think of a solution, and you just try it. Just do it. Exactly. You don't you don't start you know going in circles or contemplating the situation and going like, oh, what are our options? <laughs> you just go for for your gut instinct. Okay, this is what's wrong. This is what I need to do, and you do it. Yeah. Well, it's cool hearing you talk about the blankets too, because that resonates with all of us with home studios too. Is you know, learning that you have an incredible power to control the sound of the instrument in the space. If you, if like you say, you just do something. Don't just put a microphone in front of it and go. Well, I guess that's how it sounds. Get out there oh. and start sculpting, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, you know, that's the first question that I always ask when I work in a new studio. I always ask, how many gobos do you have? What type of gobos? How are they built? Are mm-hmm. they do they have carpet in one side, wood on the other? H- how are they? Uh, and then I ask, how many blankets do you have? How many sandbags do you have? You know, mm-hmm. And people go like, oh, is it that important? And I go like, well, it's half of the sculpturing you know, uh, process because you sculpture also micromanaging acoustic spaces. You start like, you know, affecting and changing those acoustic spaces where you actually put your microphones. So. It has a lot, it has to do a lot, lot with the sound, with the final sound. So it's not just putting the mic up, it's also uh, analyzing where you are actually going to situate the musician. Uh, is he going to be alongside the wall or uh, facing this reflective surface or not, or the opposite? So you think about all of these little aspects and you visualize in your mind how is he going to play from your memories and experience. You you start thinking, okay, if I put this microphone, it's going to sound more like this, or I could go darker like this if I do this with the blankets. And then and then you start, as you said, sculpturing the sound and, uh, yeah, creating your own little spaces in the mix. Well, so I, with my intern, I, we're redoing the control room here, and we were just walking around in there the other day. And I... I just talked to him about that too. It was just like, you know, hey man, just just take your voice and talk and walk around the loom, room and listen to how your voice sounds different and, and walk up to the corner and, and speak and notice how different it sounds. And even I was just struck by that and reminded, um, you know, it sounds so different. If, you pl- if you're the musician too, you really have an advantage because you're more likely to um, have an instrument in your hand and get a chance to try that and discover what those differences are, but, you know, taking an acoustic guitar and just walk, walk around your house and listen to how it sounds in every different space and every corner. And, you know, you, you might have a palette of 20 different acoustic guitar sounds that you can pull from just based on where you choose to record it. Absolutely. I think that, uh, uh, working with the acoustics, it's an extra, an extra tool that's so important. Is it like your extra micro microphone <laughs> in a way is like the one that's going to change most uh, the way you perceive the, the recording. And I even do the same with drums. When you are in a room where you are not quite sure how things sound, I actually put the drums in a carpet. I don't set up the microphones. I only set up a couple of overhead microphones and nothing else. And I start pulling the carpet with the whole drum set on top around the room. I mean, mm-hmm. I've done that many times and I start like evaluating, okay, what is this doing to the overall drum sound? Uh, and I listen in the in the room itself. I go to the room and I listen as the drummer is playing. And you might, you will actually discover a lot of things. No matter what they told you, like drum sound best here, but best for what? Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> sometimes you have to also take every recommendation with a grain of salt. Uh, great for what? For a jazz album? For a rock sound? For for what exactly? Uh, are you looking for more of a compressed, uh, low-mid uh, frequency sound? Uh, it is very important where you situate the instrument. And, and especially for instruments that generate a lot of SPL, a lot of sound pressure too. Yeah, because the room becomes part of the instrument at that exactly. point. Exactly. The room be- couples with the with the instrument. And depending on where you position the instrument, it's going to couple in a completely different way. All of a sudden, your low end explodes and becomes huge 
if you move it to a very specific place in the room. So yeah, that has been my my main quest, even from early on. For me, Ocean Way was an amazing, amazing score in that regard because there were so many different rooms in the complex and we were jumping from studio to studio all the time. And you had to learn uh, what you had at hand. You had to learn what your resources were. And and you really started to recognize how much things how much things could be affected by uh, different positioning, you know, uh, in the room, different microphone positioning, you know, using a completely different a completely different set of microphones, which were we were very lucky to have at Ocean Way. They actually had one of the biggest collections in the world. And I remember going mm. to the mic locker and going like, okay, I need two U47s. And you had like, I don't know, like maybe 15 available. Was that uh, Alan Sides? Yes. yes and he remember the, the the famous Alan Sides mic locker poster. Yes. <laughs> and and early on, when I was an intern, I helped reorganize the mic locker because it was a little bit of a mess. Some of the some of the microphones were like mixed with, you know, so I helped organize everything by types of microphones and whatnot. And even that process taught me a lot because I learned that we had microphones that even though there was a mic list, that I didn't even know what they looked like and what they could actually do. So I started experimenting with those when I was engineering myself. I would remember, oh, they have the 10,001. Let me try those on this other for this other purpose, for the rooms, for the for for the drums, or for this other thing. And and it really helped to have sort of like a a palette of memories of you know uh, the 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 different flavor of the different microphones and yeah how they came into play how they could come into play in a production. Yeah, very cool. Well, and uh, rock stars, I just want to remind you of something. As you listen to Rafa describe moving the drums around the studio and everything and pulling the carpet, just know that you heard it here first on recording studio, studio rock stars. One of the things uh, about Rafa that nobody ever talks about is that um, picture as he's dragging that carpet around and the drummer's on there playing, he's incredibly strong. You just must have an incredible <laughs> sense of strength. No, I always got some help. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, you know, 200-pound drummer's on there playing along. That's great. Uh, no, 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 not with the drummer on, on top of the drum. No, <laughs> not at all. Just the drum set. <laughs> A gold bar should be kept safe in a vault because it's valuable, but it could be replaced if it was ever lost. One of your songs or recordings, on the other hand, is worth more than gold because it's one of a kind. It's you, and if it was ever lost, it could never be replaced. So wouldn't you feel better knowing your music was safe? This is why I like to have a dedicated system drive, audio work drive, virtual instrument storage drive, cloud storage, and an extra large backup drive in my studio computer. And when I'm finished with the project, I move it onto a dedicated pair of external drives for archiving. Thanks to OWC, I can count on my drives being super fast, reliable, and secure so that I can work quickly and sleep soundly at night knowing my music is safe. I want your music to be safe too. Discover the best options for storage and backup for your studio from OWC at maxsales.com slash rockstars. Have you ever wished you could remove the click track bleed from a singer's vocal mic, the sound of shuffling feet from a full choir, or clicking noises from the valves of an otherwise brilliant trumpet solo? These are just some of the incredible things I've been able to clean up, edit, or remove from a recording using the magic of Isotope RX. Great for mixing with a collection of plugins for your DAW to manage plosives, clicks, S's, noise, buzz, reverb, breaths, and even guitar fret squeaks with the set it and forget it simplicity that lets you you focus on your creativity in the studio while you let Isotope handle the audio challenges. If you've ever wanted to truly feel like a magician in the studio, then Isotope RX is your magic wand. Go to isotope.com slash rockstars in the show notes and use the code ROCK10 to get an additional 10% off your first purchase. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Rafa Sardina. 
Joining us from After Hours Studios in Los Angeles, Rafa, are you ready to jam? I'm ready to jam. <laughs> All right, dude. Um, so now uh, you mentioned earlier, you, you used the word acoustic, and I was talking about moving around with a guitar, but it just reminded me to ask you specifically about the acoustic guitar and the classical flamenco guitar. You are a master of um, getting a particular sound surrounding flamenco, guitar, uh, Latino music. Uh, you know, I think of the Gypsy Kings and Rodrigo and, and Gabriela, who I also had the pleasure of recording once in my Bonnaroo studio. <laughs> and there's something about getting that sound just right. So I figured I should ask you, you know, to talk about that. What are some thoughts that you have or what are some things you've learned about recording a classical nylon string guitar and doing a great job of it? I think that um, to me, um, working on so many different styles of, uh, uh, you know, a nylon guitar music or classical guitar music or flamenco and all of that, it has to do with two different concepts. One of them, um, the ambient concept of the instrument, how ambient or how, how natural it should sound. And then there is the aspect of how much muscle do you want to pull out of those notes? of mm. that performance. And to me, it's usually a combination of two different sets of microphones, not just one single microphone that can do it all, but very often, you know, a, a well-positioned, you know, close microphone or a couple of them, and then some other more distant, you know, mid-distant, uh, mid you know, a room microphones. And sometimes I go like, truly nuts with how many microphones I set up, but I'm not doing it for the sake of recording or using every single microphone, but for the sake of exploring different textures uh, from from song to song. Like, for example, I just produced this classical album for Pablo, Pablo Sainz Villegas, uh, who signed with Sony Berlin, Sony Berlin, and mm -hmm. the album just got released, by the way. And do you know, for him, do you know, sometimes I use up to seven microphones and and I just do it to to be able to conceptualize a specific sound for each one of the pieces, for each one of the songs. So that little subtle difference that you are adding uh, or that the, act, the actual music demands is what I'm looking for, do you know? Uh, so that's why I said many different microphones, but to me, those concepts, those two separate concepts are the main core of tracking great guitars, you know, that immediacy and muscle that you can, you know, get out of the notes mm -hmm. versus the more ambient uh, sound. And when I say ambient, I don't mean distant necessarily. Sometimes it's ambient, but it's close enough to the instrument that it sounds like a, a not a, like a room sounding a uh, miking technique but uh more like honest like like a true listener kind of uh, experience right right well i mean i think of the nylon string guitar as being a combination of things there's that incredible uh, powerful detail of the plucking of the string and some of the very fast soloing notes that happen but then there's also just the the explosive smacking of the guitar and, and you know, many fingers going across the string all at once yeah. that, that seems to need to speak out into the room and, exp and light the room up for a moment, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And it is one of the instruments that really, really benefit enormously from, a, from the room, the, from a good sounding room, even from the floor, the way it reflects from the floor. I mean, just do the experiment of putting a carpet or even a light carpet, not even like a dense carpet underneath the player and the sound is going to change dramatically. Um, those reflections, those early reflections from the instrument uh, have a, you know, have, have a big, you know, play a big role in the overall sound. So when you say you put a, um, a dense carpet, you're saying, if it was a wooden hard floor, add a dense carpet to tighten it up a little bit or the reverse? It, no, just the reverse. But if you want to, for example, you know, double guitars and double them with a slightly different texture, the same way that you will do, be doing where you are like actually doubling uh, violins or strings 
on a separate take to create like a separate layer. Uh, and when and you ask them to play muted, it will be equivalent to that. Uh, even with just with the acoustics or actually putting some uh, blankets, dense blankets on a stand and putting them on the sides, you know, to the musician, you automatically are creating like a completely different texture. And you're That's saying more, maybe do that when muted. they do a muted, a muted sound. Okay, cool. Exactly, yeah. It's especially, you know, for when you want to double parts and you don't want them to sound exactly the same, you don't necessarily have to just rely on the microphones. You can rely on changing the acoustics yeah. slightly from one take to the other. That's brilliant. I, You know I love moving a, a singer around on the mic slightly for doubles and things like that, but uh, but you make such a great point. I forget to just change the quality of the space. Yes, and and I learned that an awesome way too from some really brilliant you know engineers that I work with, and and I have to really you know uh, give it to them. I mean, like. Uh, I was so privileged, you know, I worked with Glyn Jones and Andy Jones and George Massenberg and wow. uh, Phil Ramon and so many other, um, Andy Wallace and all of the Laura Algis. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and it really, it really makes a big difference to, you know, to be creative that way because you're actually adding production value to your recording as an engineer. Mm -hmm. You're adding something that can be used in the mix stage and and you can actually further manipulate it, but you are actually playing with a slight advantage because you are you already created a canvas that's more interesting from the recording uh, side of things. And I I really started experimenting like more in depth when I started mixing more and more and more. And every time, because I used to do do like 50-50 all the time, even from my early years, but when I was more in demand for mixing, that's when my recording style also changed because I started to recognize where the missed opportunities were even in the recording stage. I'll always yeah. be thinking when somebody will give me some tracks, send me some tracks to mix, I'll go like, damn, why didn't they set this extra microphone uh, for this specific type of music, right? Why didn't they set an extra, you know, big diaphragm, you know, condenser microphone uh, behind the drummer? Or why didn't do uh, use this other technique or why? And they could have. Very often they had the resources, but but probably didn't have the imagination to do it. Yeah, or they, sessions they missed, just go they, quickly sometimes. Yeah, they missed on the opportunity, yeah. So, well you, well, you make a great point, too. So, I think we've probably heard the story of the beginning of a process informing the end. So, in other words, we've, we're familiar with the story of somebody who says, oh, I'd really I really want to be a mixer. And then they get the advice, well, you should really learn how to record first, or you should, you know, you should take up live audio because... You know, Vance Powell, for example, would suggest that live audio is a great starter because it puts you under pressure and you learn how to do things quickly and everything. Um, but you make such a great point. It's a reminder that it's a it's a two-way street, um, that the act of learning how to mix is also going to tell you how to track better. Absolutely, and vice versa. It, it really works both ways. Um, and yeah, and exactly, yeah. And And then you start like, paying more attention to detail. You what, really start paying more attention to detail. Yeah. What are some, if, if I was to say, what are the most common mistakes that people make when they deliver tracks to you for a mix? Is there anything that just comes up a lot? Uh, the lack of coherence in multi-miking uh, an instrument. For example, a drum set will be the perfect example. Or the same thing for a, a small ensemble or like a, a small uh, orchestral ensemble, things like that where it lacks, it lacks coherence. What the room mics are telling you um, is not is not coherent with, your, with, with what you have in your head, in your mind, in terms of the final sound of things. And very often, people uh, also missed on the opportunity because they think uh, things are done like one, very specific way. People are actually very afraid of big ensembles, like a big 
I'm the terrified, man. <laughs> orchestra set up or a big band. I've done so many of those, but it's a learning process too. And you have to be adventurous enough to, to say, okay, I'm going to move the musicians like this way because this is what I want. Mm -hmm. This is how it's going to affect my space. This is how it's going to, obviously, always respecting uh, the musicians in terms of then being able to to play together, <laughs> which is another common mistake. You know, when when you move things around in the studio and they're not even comfortable playing, yeah, and you're affecting yeah. the per the performance. That's a no no. But sometimes you take things to the a little bit to the extreme in order to, uh, you know, to find this new sound or this new space that you have in your head. And if you don't do it, you'll never know. You'll never know if it's really possible to to achieve it. Um, it's like uh, people think that somebody sets the orchestra, sets the chairs, and that's it. That's the first thing I always do. I have a sound in my head. I imagine a sound, and I start I start moving all of the chairs. The way oh, I wild. envision, you know, how it should project the width of the orchestra. What kind of studio are you recording in? Are are there reflective walls on the sides or not? Uh, do you want to actually add some gobos with the reflective side on the sides, you know, of the of the room, so you get more side reflection and it changes the width? Um, those kind of things are the first things that you do in the first ten minutes. Um, you know, you hit the room. The first ten minutes you are in the room, you start moving the chairs, and if if needed, if necessary, you tell the mis the players to just, you know. Get up and you, because you have to move the chairs, you have to re readjust, you know, how they are seated. So that's the first thing you do. And then you move the microphones accordingly. Obviously, you do that having your own perspective on where the microphones are going to fall or are going to be uh, positioned. But it's it's a combo of both things. Yeah, it's funny. I, th I do the exact same thing for tracking a band in the studio. I spend mm -hmm. a lot of time at the beginning just thinking about where everybody's going to be and how they're going to see each other and and what the position should be. And is that going to give enough room to just, you know, set up, you, you get the sound, but also just to have your sheet music in front of you or your controller or all those little details, you know, are we going to, is the, is the intern or the assistant going to trip all over the cables when they try and go in the room to adjust something later? Um, no, there's absolutely. so many parts. There are so many factors. And also, and you also ev evaluate, you know, if there are any songs in the repertoire that are going to need, you know, changing the sound, changing the right, sound. Right, right. And then, and then, yeah, you you position things accordingly or you leave extra options in order to even readjust the drums or or whoever might be, you know, you might need to move in the studio. So those are the main considerations that... Uh, you know, you have to think about uh, as you are setting up the, the studio. I always said, you know, recording is and choosing the microphones and adjusting them and moving them is one thing, but there's also a pre-production to the recording. Mm -hmm. There's like a pre-recording production that happens in your head. It doesn't happen even on site, but you imagine the space, you imagine how is it going to play, how is it going to... Um, you know, even, uh, you know, amplify those instruments or the mm -hmm. way it's going to, you know, affect the sound. And then you choose the microphones and the spaces accordingly. And you imagine all of that in your head. You still haven't heard that note, but that's sort of like the pre-recording production that I'm talking about. Yeah, well, I'm glad you talked about uh, moving things because that's a reminder to me. Uh, one of the lessons I've learned is the more permanent you make something on a tracking session, the more likely you're probably going to have to move that thing that you just made really hard to move. <laughs> Absolutely. The, the moment you apply some gaffer tape exactly. <laughs> to some cables, you know that's going to that's gonna move. That's the one that's moving. I tell the interns, I'm like, don't tape it down. You guys, they always want to impress you with making it look really neat. And they do. And it looks really beautiful. And it's got a nice little curl in, you know, the way the cable coils yeah. up. And I go, you're going to have to move that. It's the first one that's going to get moved. Yeah, I, and that's actually quite a bummer. I have even some anecdotes. I remember a recording session with Alice Smith uh, at Ocean Way, and I'll never forget that 
everything, it was, this was for an orchestral date and it was a big session, maybe like 60 players or 65 players, big, big session. And I remember that uh, I helped, you know, set up everything in the studio and everything was, you know, uh, tied together and taped. And we had exactly that same philosophy that you were just talking about. Never tape permanently anything until the engineer has double check, triple check everything, and that's the way he wants it, right? Or she wants it. Mm -hmm. And I do remember that specific date, I'll walk in and say like, hell no, it's the other way around. It was like an 180 degrees opposite, like the conductor needed to be on the other side. That's the way oh, yeah. he had imagined the session happening. And we all went like, oh God, everything <laughs> yeah. was taped. Everything was like... <laughs> That's like when the drummer walks in and you and you're like, "What do you mean you're a lefty drummer?" <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> we had to do that. Uh, so I, I did a, a studio at the Bonnaroo Festival for 15 years called the Hay Bale Studio. Very small. Yeah. That's where I recorded Rodrigo and Gabrielle. Um, oh, okay, awesome. And it was very small, dead room space, you know, and and everything's done very quickly and very live uh, recordings that will go out on the radio, and and. We barely could fit a drum set in there, and we could barely get the get even get to the cables to change it. But sure enough, you just had to be ready because somebody's going to walk yeah. in and tear the drum kit apart or or be a lefty that for that session. Yeah, <laughs> it was such a nightmare flipping it all around. Um, so you've worked with a lot of different artists, and I want to make sure we get a chance to talk about some of these unexpected artists. Um, you know, for example, I, I believe you've worked with Dr. Dre. Um, and I wondered if you could talk about that experience or any of that part of your world. Yeah, there was a period of time where I worked with Dre and I worked with a lot of um, uh, artists associated with that camp, you know, with Snoop Dogg or Exhibit and uh, many different rappers and a lot of R&B. And, and obviously that was for me a change of production philosophy too, because um they approach a recording in a very different way. Even when it was an acoustic recording that that was meant to be part of you know, the track, uh, even as an acoustic instrument, but even that, they approach it in such a, um, how would I call it, you know, um, in such a way that, um, you know, at the beginning, you could think like it lack respect for the, <laughs> for mm -hmm. you know, for the meaning of recording acoustically something like this, but it actually opened my mind so much. Mm. It it made me realize that you cannot be precious about the process. You can only be precious about the final result. And when I would listen to what Dre meant by doing things his way, then everything was clear to me. Oh, he he hears things differently, in a different way. He has there is purpose to what he's doing, and that opened that door for me to never ever have any preconceptions about anything. Always follow the leader or whoever has a concept in their head. Mm -hmm. Try to understand it. Never dismiss it. Mm -hmm. That's where you are actually becoming inadequate for the project as a collaborator. You to be a true collaborator, you have to dig into people's minds. You have to really get to understand what they mean by what by what they're saying. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it can be unexpected sometimes because especially when you're beginning and somebody that you're working with is communicating to you and they may not be famous like Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg yet. They might just be somebody you don't know anything about them yet. But 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 I, I agree with you that like I've learned that um, there's a great opportunity to assume that everybody who suggests something, you know, an artist that comes in with a vision for the product project has something incredibly valuable in their vision and you just need to help find it. Yes, absolutely. And and you you need to learn to embrace even the most unorthodox way of doing things. Mm -hmm. Because then you realize, even when I receive some tracks from uh, inexperienced, you know, uh, artists that have their own home studios and do things their way, and they send you a track and you go like, what the hell is this? This is amazing. This is like, how do you get that sound? And then 
they explain it to you and you're like, really? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> it might be the most unorthodox way or or the the wrong way of to do things, but then they discover like a new alley. They discover a new sound and you go like, damn, you know, they, they really were up to something. So that's why I never, I'm not quick at judging anybody's methodology, how they do things. I never do. I always look for more opportunities to the way they are doing things, but I never intend to change their ways. I I try to always complement the ways of do, doing things and try to open new opportunities uh, to them. But when I'm collaborating with an artist, that's where I'm really up to. I'm always thinking nonstop about how I fit in and how I can actually even amplify their art and the way of doing things, but never thinking about changing their way of doing things. And sometimes you change the way they do things because they discover your ways to be even better or easier or more fulfilling in terms of the result. But you can never assume that's going to be the case. Right. But, and then they want to do it that way all the time. Then they're like, hey, man, remember that thing you did? Let's do that again. <laughs> yeah. Bill Cheney, the founder of Spectra 1964, kept getting the same question from customers. What DI should they use with the 610 series comp limiters? After trying to recommend various DIs while making excuses for the way they all sounded, he realized that the solution was to create the perfect direct input box himself. Thus, the BBDI passive direct box from Spectra 1964 was born. By using Spectra design concepts and standards, the BBDI provides a low distortion and flat response design that is unequal by any standard or measure. The absence of harmonic distortion and articulation of signal detail is readily apparent. This is all done with a passive transformer type design that will provide years of trouble-free operation. Simply put, the BBDI is the best sounding bass DI I've ever used. It'll move your pant leg. No hype, no color, just pure tone at spectra1964.com. If your goal was to climb Mount Everest, you would hire a Sherpa to guide you to the summit. If you wanted to sail around the world, you would hire a seasoned sea captain for a safe voyage. And if you wanted to try skydiving, you wouldn't just jump out of an airplane without being strapped to an expert, right? So why would you send off your mix for mastering without knowing that it was ready first? Wouldn't it be great to have a professional mastering engineer with a trained ear to guide you through the final stages of mixing? Brian Murphy is your trusted guide at soundporter.com home of the iterative mastering process, where you get to interact with a professional mastering engineer who listens to what you want and will give you mix feedback to help you get your mix ready for mastering. Contact Brian now for a free mix review and mastering demo so that you can hear it before you buy it at soundporter.com. Well, so do you, are there any, um, any stories you want to share or anything you remember about Dr. Dre or Snoop Dogg, for example, uh, um, any details about something that they were that they were hearing differently that you had to discover? Yeah, do you know how quick they were at um, uh, recognizing when something was the way they wanted it, they wanted or not, uh, and how quick and fast they were at manipulating sounds and doing it in in extreme kind of ways. You know, you will record something from the MP and they will be applying like uh, 30 dBs of EQ, like, uh, you know, putting two EQs, uh, you know, back to back in order to get an extra, whatever, 10 dBs of uh, gain mm -hmm. or on something. And you're like, oh, and you will be thinking like, oh no, you don't do things that way. And then you find out that, yeah, you can do things that way. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, totally, it's totally cool to do it that way. And it's totally fine to do it that way. Uh, have you actually reached the sound that you uh, have in your head or not? Then you need more EQ. I mean, just do it. So that's where I learned to be less precious about the process, like we're talking, right? Uh, and also uh, the purpose, purpose within the mix, because when you are mixing a lot, um, something that you learn after a while is that when somebody, you know, is evaluating your mix and they go like, oh man, that guitar sounds like so cool and blah, blah, how do you do it? And then they dare you 
solo it, right? And you solo it and it sounds like crap by itself, <laughs> right? It really sounds like over-processed and you name it, like totally inadequate by itself. And then you realize, yeah, I'm, I'm doing what I do for a final purpose. I'm not doing it to fulfill a, a specific um, targets, you know, like I'm mm -hmm. going to make the, the drum sound amazing and then I'm going to make the a, a guitar, this guitar sound amazing. It's like, no, you, you are trying to make the song sound amazing mm -hmm. and project an emotion. The rest doesn't really matter. Yeah, it's kind of like taping down the mic cables. As long as yeah. the final <laughs> result of the session is amazing, it doesn't really matter whether the mic cables were taped down or not. Exactly. Nobody's going to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so another artist that you work with, uh, D'Angelo, um, share a story about about doing that record. Um, you know, there's that that uh, is now is that um, is that Roots playing drums on that stuff? Am yeah, I getting that they, right? re they recorded that in New York, and it was all done in parts. We did actually record the orchestra. What you hear as an orchestra, mm -hmm. it's actually in my home studio in LA. Oh, that's great because I wanted to ask you all about the beautiful strings on uh, Really that Love. That's my home studio in LA. That's actually the room I'm standing at right now. And it was done in part because it's a limited space. Obviously, we couldn't actually feel like 16 players all at once. But I work with this amazing arranger, uh, Brent Fisher, and he actually brought me into the project himself. And so I have to thank him, you know, for doing that. And the rest of the team agreed and I became part of the of the team. And we basically had to uh, work on how we're going to tie all of these musical parts together and record it in layers and parts and how they're going to fit together and, and whatnot. And same as we were talking earlier, it had to do with imagining a very specific type of space and then applying the existing space plus other resources you know, a, a, you know, placement of the musicians in the room, how distant they were or how wide, how I, I was going to be recording my room microphones, even though the room is small and it's not going to uh, record like the, a lot of ambience, it's going to record the space of the room. Mm -hmm. And and then I could amplify the space of the room using even other resources. Like I remember for that specific record, I used the Sony sampling river i know it's a very old device but uh, i have had a lot of luck uh, over the years using using it and now there are many many different other other different resources like altiverb and mm -hmm. many other spaces but i use that to individually to each one of the recorded tracks amplified you know their space and how far they reach to the left to the to the right the depth all of that. So we created that with a, a lot of a lot of good planning in terms of how we're going to create that landscape. Well, it's very cool, and, and it's almost um, you almost did a great job of of tricking my ear a little bit because there is a lot of space around those strings um, that surround an otherwise very tight track. I would I would describe it right. Um, yeah. But also, like I found myself going, are those sampled strings or are they real strings? Because it was like. Something about the way you layered them and shaped it, and maybe the um, maybe the the strings you created could do things that you wouldn't expect from strings. I thought it was very cool. Yeah, and it has to do a lot with Brent's arrangements too. You yeah. know the way he writes um, his arrangements and writes music, and we also collaborated on another very cool album that has the same type of um, ambiences and spaces for the orchestra, and that was the. Um, that was the the uh, Elvis Costello and the Roots album. Oh, cool! And we actually did like uh, seven of those tracks, and we recorded that in a much bigger space, more like um, a space, you know, feeder for those kind of recordings. He was at Conway Recording Studios, and but we also use the same type of concept because he uses a lot of unusual textures from instruments in order to double other instruments. For example, he will have some kind of a uh, brass instrument doubling the celli, and you are unable to distinguish between the two. But it creates like a very peculiar type of thickness to the arrangement. And then you think like, oh, there must have been like 
six uh, cello players, cello players. I know, indeed, there were only two, but then there was another layer of the brass creating these textures, you know, with the phoniums and different types of instruments that, um, you know, uh, enforce, you know, reinforce some specific textures and and spaces. Um, yeah, it's all about your imagination, really. And that's where you have to work very closely together with a ranger. That's cool. I love layering of instruments like that. And I'm always, it just gets me so excited when I hear orchestral arranging and, you know, le- you know somebody's playing a, a, a xylophone on top of a, or, or like a glockenspiel on top of strings and these different voicings. And that stuff just, you know, like, I just think like, how, how do you even come up with that? I mean, you just have to have a lot of chance to learn it, to know how to make those different kind of voicings. Um, another question I wanted to ask you related to horns, um, you know, uh, uh, if I pronounce it right, Flora del Tol- Toloche. Toloche, yeah. Toloche, okay. Um, and many of the other records that you do too, uh, including like Alejandro Fernandez, um, just great horn recordings. Um, a lot of instruments that are very Latino. Uh, there's a... Um, there's a whole collection of instruments that just make great sounds. I love everything from accordion to the, the, the nature of the drums that happen and stuff like that. But as far as horns go, wh- what should we know about recording and mixing horns for Latino music? Um, you know, I know there's that question could be wide ranging. It could be, uh, well, are you doing an old style or are you doing a new style? Um, talk a little bit about stuff that, you know, let's say we're walking in for our first session to do some horns. What are some of the questions we should be asking ourselves? Uh, I think that the first thing that you need to master, other than choosing the right type of microphones in terms of how bright they are or not, uh, is how to manage the distance to the to the instrument, how far you should be to the instrument. And it depends a lot on the type of music they're playing and how forceful that type of music is or not. Um, and the second one to me will be the use of the room microphones. I rarely ever ever record any any horns without room microphones. The room microphones are part of the sound to me. Always are part of, part of the sound. So, uh, and again, it doesn't need to be like super distant room microphones, but more like a mid-distance kind of room microphones. And I always try to, to get the best coherence in terms of a phase between the closer microphone and the room microphones. And very often to achieve that, uh, yeah, I have uh, maybe the player moving the room farther or closer. So I could have the assistant moving the the close microphone, you know, uh, mm-hmm. do a few tests like super quickly. I never, you never want to bother the, the player into, you know, being just testing and testing. I right. always try to avoid that. Especially with uh, horns, because you have to you have something called embouchure. I learned the hard yes, way that yeah, embouchure absolutely. doesn't last forever. <laughs> absolutely. So you only have room for a, you know, I always say like you have room for a minute of testing with any of these type of experiments. So you have to be ready to even have like an A and B option and or even set up two microphones of the same at different distances from the room microphones. And then you you can have the musician just move from one to the other and make the, the final decision. Like in two seconds, you know, oh, it's this one. It sounds so much better this way. You know how it couples with the room microphones. So again, that's preparation. You know, uh, when you go set up something, you don't just go like set up the one microphone. That's why I very often set up like three different microphones. And it could even be like two of the same, but at different distances. So I can actually... A, a, B without having a, to move things around too much or, or wasting any time. But for me, recording the room microphones and having the right uh, room uh, room sound is very important. And very often, the the room microphones are actually quite uh, close to each other. Like I usually don't use even X, Ys, but use like a space pair microphones. But being very very careful about you know. Uh, uh, facing issues between the two room microphones that I'm using. How, how um, so you're talking about a spaced pair, but not spaced yes. very far apart? 
a space pair, but not very far apart. Sometimes they are even only like, it depends on the type of microphone, but for example, when I'm using M49s, uh, I could be using, uh, I could be, they could be only be like a foot away from each other. But obviously, I always experiment with the face and the angle of the microphones and see if there is any notch in the middle of this, you know, in the center. Mm -hmm. So very often I do that with um, either microphones or I have the assistant, you know, tilting one of the microphones slightly, moving it a few inches one way or the other till you find that sweet spot. Interesting. So the microphones that are spaced might turn in towards each other like pigeon toe, or they might turn out away from each other. Exactly. Yeah, they might turn away from each other, but in their in their axis, using the yeah. axis of the microphone stand, right? So you you can actually you know uh, see how it affects the center mm -hmm. uh, and the space that you're looking for, and and if if it's the right sound for you in terms of the space, but there is too much. Uh, you are notching the, the center too much, you might actually then get the two microphone stands closer together. Right, so you it's know? the... It's you the, tilt them away, there's the angle yeah. of tilt, but then there is also the distance between the two microphones. Oh, that's great. And then what about, um? do you use the mono button? Do you find that's really helpful when you're doing well, a space pair like that? I use the mono, mono button all the time. <laughs> um, let's talk about that. Why? Why? What do we need to know about a mono button? Why do we want to have a mono button in the studio? Yeah, you want to really be aware of how much cancellation you are actually putting into the recording. And the same thing for mixing, same same thing for mixing. You know, you want to know, uh, because when you are canceling way too much, um, you are also diminishing from the, uh, from the guts of the mix. You are sort of like diminishing that factor, that aspect of the mix. So it's a balance between that, you know, achieving the kind of spaces that you're looking for, but versus, you know, uh, diminishing some of the impact that that specific instrument can have in the mix. Uh, so it's up to your own judgment, really, but the only way to really know how much content is being sucked out by uh, cancellation is by using the mono Mono switch, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's good advice. I guess here in Nashville, then then we like to ask the smart ass question. Um, hey dude, if you get that center image just right, do you think they're gonna like the song any better? <laughs> 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 the secret to a great mix is to start with great source tracks. And this means you need great microphones. Jay-Z Mics in Riga, Latvia brings you the new BB29 Signature Series microphone to help your recordings add clarity and detail to your mixes. At the heart of Jay-Z Microphones is the unique Golden Drop capsule design with a lighter, faster diaphragm that delivers great clarity and fidelity without distracting colorations and distortions. The new BB29 microphone has a Class A discrete amplifier circuit, extremely low self-noise, and transformer-coupled output to bring an expensive sound to your studio for an affordable price. Jay-Z offers a five-year warranty, free shipping to the U.S., and a 30-day money-back guarantee. Plus, for a limited time, you can use the coupon code ROCKSTARS to get 50% off the BB29 at jayzmike.com. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Rockstars of Drums will show you how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a Nashville session drummer and a Grammy-winning studio. Want to start mastering your own records? Rockstars of Mastering walks you through exactly how I mastered my own record using nothing but plugins and pre-sona Studio One. Want to learn how to create a mix that doesn't suck but rocks instead? At Mix Master Bundle, I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins so that you can have punchy, powerful drums, guitars that rock, bass you can feel, and a mix that is in your face. Plus, it's totally free as my way of saying thanks for listening. Then go to MixMasterBundle.com to get started for free now and look for the clickable link in the show notes below. All right, so let's let's jump forward and talk a little bit about mixing then. Um, you know, you do a lot of mixing. You got a lot of experience with it. Um, you have a console. I think you you do a combination of maybe mixing in the box and in the console. What what do you want to say about that? Do you uh, do you like to mix strictly on the console or strictly in the box or a combination? Uh, it's a combination, and it depends on the project too. Um, 
I have the big luxury of having both available. So uh, it, it all comes to my concept in my head about um, how punchy I want and what kind of punchy <laughs> I'm looking for. Uh, for example, if I have something that um, has a lot of, you know, low-end content and is very specific, you know, it's a very specific type of low-end content, you have to be very careful with your analog processes because they can actually change it quite a bit and change the nature of the sound that, uh, you know, was originally conceived for the song. I'm talking specifically about kicks and 808s and whatnot. Uh, that you have to be very careful with. And very often I decide to have those in the box or keep those in the box. And other elements, I might just, uh, or a combo, if I want to add an extra layer of, t of texture that is more analog, analog sounding and very different, and it's just like a parallel sound add being added to the original sound. So it all depends on how you conceive the final mix to be. You, you think about the clarity of, of the mix or lack of clarity. There, there is something I learned early on, you know, working with Don was, and, and I remember this specific session I was working, working on, and somebody made a comment, uh, hey, hey, dude, uh, I don't really hear the bass. And, and Don just turned around and said like, cool, right? Do you, so again, <laughs> pur purpose and concept, you know, it, it, the guy didn't say it as a compliment. It wasn't meant to be a compliment. He was actually complaining about not hearing the bass. But conceptually, that's what Don was Don was was looking for. Yeah. So and and spe specifically being a, a bass player, he really knew what he was looking for uh, from the bass in a in a track. So it all comes down to concept. So uh, we talk about this quite a lot. You know, uh, clarity versus glue in a mix, right? How much clarity or um, how much you want a sound to feel very individual and, you know, be by itself versus how much you want, want it to glue with the rest of the mix. And, it ha and even our analog processes can add to that, can add to the glue. So, for example, if I use uh, the SSL and I'm I have the the drums in the uh, in the SSL, and then I also add the the bass to the SSL. It's actually gonna glue much better with the drums. But if I wanted to make it like super super distinct, I might actually use a different bass and just keep it you know in the box and keep it like super distinct from the drums. There is something about summing things together or not that change the whole perception. And if I want to achieve like a middle point in between, I might do 50-50. I might put it on an extra fader on the SSL and add some of the bass to the drum bus. So, and this is something that Jack Joseph Puig used a lot. And Michael Brower used a lot too. Do you know, like yeah. using uh, additional buses uh, to create a specific type of feelings, right? Or processes like you you have one that uh, gives you more mid-range and low gives you more thump in the mix and and then anything that you want to to have more of that you send to this bus or if you want to things to be more uh, feel more compressed but in a, a stereo space you you use a very specific type of eq and compressor in a bus uh, and you fit things into that bus as needed so you can do the same thing in the box, by the way, just being very, I don't know, uh, knowing what you are doing and setting things up prior to, to the session. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing that I actually do a lot when I'm mixing. I have a lot of resources ready to be used. Um, and uh, there's this amazing feature in Pro Tools called uh, Save, uh, you know, import session data, right? Yeah. Where you can actually import templates of things that you have used in the past and you can experiment with those quickly, taking you like just a few seconds or a, or a couple of minutes instead of uh, taking you like half an hour 
like he used to take us, you know, in the old days. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm pretty slow about my import session data. <laughs> 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 no, but I love hearing that stuff. And I think that sometimes, I, th I think sometimes we hear the story about, you know, the browerizing your mix or, or the, the Rafaizing your mix now, we'll call it, um, where you've got the multiple different mix buses. And I think we can be inclined to think, oh, what's, wh what do we need to know? What's the right answer? And I, I would, I would, I'm inclined to believe that there isn't necessarily the right answer. There is, you need to arrive at what those mix bus options are for yourself and your own style and your own way of mixing, right? Absolutely. It has to be your own proposal. It cannot be somebody else's and just take it, uh, and just take it. I mean, you have to experiment, modify, see if it works for you. And if it doesn't, move to the next, to the next option or to the next idea. And I've done that over the years so many times. And you also start like changing your style from project to project. And, and I try not to repeat myself. You know, it really bores me. Uh, um, it bores me to just use the same resources, the same templates. I use them as a way of, you know, a way to experiment, further experiment. I have them available. But when I'm approaching a mix, I move fairly quick in the first couple of hours of a mix. And that's where I make my biggest decisions. That's where I go like, do you know what? Let's try something different for, for this drum sound. Or let's use this, uh, you know, daisy chain of uh, of effects uh, for the snare or let's yeah but obviously you have to know your studio pretty well and your or your pro tools session template pretty well in order to move fast i think it's important to move fast okay so if you use the power of templates but you don't um you don't do the same thing every time so so you must have a system that you've found works for you to save a good idea and then be able to reuse that a good idea later. What what are some tips about that? I mean, do you have some clever ways to just sort of extract a really cool routing from a mix and set it aside and then import it in later and, and sort of just keep track of all these things? Yes, I have like a folder that's called like a Pro Tools template. And that's where I dump a, a specific, you know, Pro Tools sessions and but it's good to describe them and know which artists you use that for or what song you use that for and what's cool about that one. For example, I will have <clears throat> a very cool one about uh, you know having to do with flamenco sounds or flamenco percussion, right? The way it's used in flamenco music. And it usually has to do with the use of even effects or rivers. So I have a template where I have those instruments with the sense and whatnot, but most importantly, a uh, I have a well enough documented description of what the effects are. So I might have like seven different reverbs, but they are very well described. I put in the comments, I always put something in the comments of the Pro Tools track. I go like a, a sort early reflection, or I go like a early reflection, a low end. A, do you know, I have my own particular code. And I think that it's important to document that too quickly as you are working on, on a session, because otherwise uh, you are not going to know what's what anymore. And you're going to spend a lot of time trying to find what made that sound cool. For example, you have a djembe and it was sent to seven different rivers for a good reason, but two of them were very, very specific. You better describe them because in 48 hours, you are not going to remember anymore. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm good at describing things as I'm, I start working. Even when I'm relabeling the, the tracks, I usually get rid of the original name of the track and, and I paste it to the comments and then, and then I give it my own name. For example, okay. I'll, it could say like electric guitar seven and I change it, fatty guitar, do you know, I, or... Or, mm -hmm. or or tremolo vibey guitar. So it's my own code within the mix. So I use my instincts and don't have to read too much. I don't have to read or explore what things mean. Uh, I can just move quickly. Now, do you, if you're in a mix and you've got an organ that set up that, you know, you've got a track that's got plugins on it, maybe it's got some routing, maybe it's got an effect. Do you just select those tracks and do like the export 
track as tracks as template feature in Pro yes. Tools and send it yeah, over yes. to that folder? Okay. Yes, I, I do that too, yeah. All right, that's groovy. I, I need to start a, um, incorporating that more. I've still, my old school version would always be to mix the first song of a record, then import that to the next song, see how it works. And then about two or three songs deep, I'm like, which song had the organ on it? And, and which song <laughs> sounded cool and sounded bad? Which was the rock one? Which was the, the you know, We'll we go through that. We'll go through that too. I mean. um, all right, Groovy, let's see. Uh, so another feature of mixing that is really important that you've had some great things to say about is, um, you know, the, the, uh, the importance of panning and really creating space around things. And uh, there was a video where you did that you did for Waves, where you talked about um, using their S1 plugin, and and I wondered if you wanted to talk further about interesting ways to pan and create space. Um, you know, should we just should we just use the pan knob, or are there some other clever ways for us to create space around instruments and put it all together? Oh, I think that there are some new ways of doing it, like with plugins like the Waves S1 that you mentioned, or even the Nugent Audio, you know, uh, Stereoizer. I mean, there are so many different ways to now even pan within a specific stereo field and pan it in a different kind of way. So the the main core of the sound uh, is not the is not the you know the room. It, the room content of the sound is not panned the same way as the main core of the of the sound. So you can actually experiment and tilt things that way. Uh, that's what I call, or I would consider, tilting versus panning. You know, one thing right. is to pan things in one direction, a different thing is to tilt things in a different direction. Because when you are tilting, you are further affecting the room content of that sound, of that stereo sound. Obviously, uh, when we're panning, I, and the specific thing I'm I'm talking about is when you are panning stereo content. Do you know an instrument that's already stereo, has some type of stereo content? Yeah. And you can pan with both pan pots, right? And determine what range of the stereo field it occupies. But something that you could do differently is instead of panning, use some kind of plugin or a combination of plugging and, and panning where you can actually tilt the sound. And, and I use that a lot, and it allows you to create many more space within the stereo field. Oh, that's interesting. I remember the first time I learned to do more than just pan something you know, with the pan knob was a, a project that Tom Lord Algae was mixing for us, and mm -hmm. he took a guitar that was otherwise mono, and he and he gave a short delay to it and panned that over to the right. And I was yeah. like, what was that? You know? <laughs> and, and now, of course, same, yeah. I do that stuff all the time if I can. And the same thing with the reverb returns. You know, very often I have dedicated a reverb returns for a specific instruments. You know, if I want to put a specific guitar in its own space that's particularly panned in a range in the stereo field, I will dedicate an additional, you know, plugin with an additional, you know, send uh, for that specific instrument. So that will become a dedicated river for, you know, for that for that instrument. So I do that a lot, mm -hmm. and it makes a difference to have it to have the river in a separate auxiliary track instead of having it as a plugin in the instrument itself. Because when you put it in the, in the instrument itself, you have no control. Of this, uh, of the placement of this space, you know, right. when you put it in a separate, you know, return, you can further, you know, tilt or change that river return. Yeah, I think that's very cool. And I was going to ask you about that, about just um, drive versus reverb in general on your mixes, because I feel like you really m are a master of including reverbs that are subtle. Um, they're not too, they're there, but they're not too much. And I wondered if you had thoughts about, you know, how, how we can use reverbs better and how we can make sure that we're, we're creating a mix that, you know, is lush in its mixed quality, but it's not too much reverb. We don't have to like knock some, sometimes it's fun to hit them over the head with the reverb, but it gets old after a while, you know? Yeah, I know what you mean. And, and I think that another key aspect of it is automating the returns of the reverbs. 
descents and the returns you know of the rivers so it is very important to also uh, if if it creates a texture that you love but the fact that it is too much in the tales of some phrases or some musical lines if it's too much uh, then you can always use you know automation and automate you know that return on some specific passages of the music so th- that way you benefit from uh, creating the ambience and the texture that you are looking for but then you know you avoid you know the unwanted uh, you know artifact of hearing the river like big time you know at the end of a phrase things like that so i think the automation is essential for the use of rivers um, have you had much of a chance to play around with the um, exponential audio uh, now isotope Michael Carnes reverbs like um, Nimbus and R4 and those ones? Oh yes, uh, I just started like not that long ago, and I think they're uh, they're fantastic. Uh, I love what they do. I really love what they do. Another company that I really love how they uh, sample the rivers and the river options. It's Overloud. You know, this company, Overloud mm-hmm. Remetrix, um, that river that they make. I'm actually creating my own presets for some of that um, right now. I mean, I love some of the options that they give you. And actually, some of the JJP um, presets that they have are also fantastic. Okay, cool. Um, and those are like, many of them are very unusual spaces. And mm-hmm. that's what I love about them. Yeah. Uh, that they have to do more with creating a different type of texture with the use with the usage of a river rather than just trying to add ambience to something it's not just about adding ambience sometimes you are trying to affect um, the vibe of the instrument per se uh, and you know the texture you are not trying to make it sound like rivery or 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 being able to distinct uh, hear any distinct delay you are trying to to change the vibe. Yeah. And I, 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 that's why I love those type of rivers. Yeah, and I, I think that's a, something that I remember discovering that's fun is that there is that difference. There are times sometimes where I want a very realistic room sound because I'm maybe I am mixing a, a jazz record that should sound natural mm-hmm. and I'm looking for a natural sounding space around the instrument versus the other times where it should be something totally different. And I think at first, you know, you're just like, I should try reverb on this. Well, which, what does that sound like? You know? Yeah. <laughs> but um, there's so many cool ones out there. Um, another um, company that I've, I've always admired, Eventide, uh, I think I saw a video where you might have done something with the H9000. I have one of those here, yes. and I've been mm-hmm. experimenting with it. It's such a deep box that it's going to take me a while before I finally know it. Um, but have you? Do you want to? Do you have any thoughts about that, or or ways that you found that? Uh, are you using that in your in your studio? Oh yes, I'm I'm using it in my studio. Yeah, it's part of my every mix. I love the fact that uh, now you have a um, a piece of software plugin that um, where you can actually save all of your presets and save your you know per session, you know per song, so you can save everything that you are using on the on the unit and save it with the sun. Right. Um, and that way you don't have to ever think about documenting or re- remembering to save in the unit itself, you know, saving your presets and noting them down for a specific mix, mix as part of the documentation. Uh, the more you can avoid, uh, you know, the extra steps or extra documentation, the better. And and I love that unit. It has some of the classic sounds that we grew up listening to, Mm -hmm. but it has so many new cool sounds too that, yeah, it's it's really great. How do you connect it to your mix setup? Do you sort of go analog in and out or do you use some of the digital features that will integrate it? I have both because I have some units coming back to my SSL and the other ones are in the box. Oh, so okay, they connect cool. dig- digitally in the box, and it connects to the to the computer via Ethernet through an Ethernet cable. Mm-hmm. That way, you can actually control it from from the computer. Yeah, that's a great uh, use case example for why it's so interesting to have the four different modules and the different ways to get in and out. I hadn't thought of that. That you know, in a setup like yours, you might want some of it to be analog and some of it to be digital. Yeah, mm-hmm. very cool. <laughs> 
you feel like the time you spent watching YouTube videos, trying out mix tricks, and tweaking version after version of your mixes has gotten you nowhere? Have you been looking for a simple, straightforward, step-by-step -step process for creating a pro mix that won't take years to learn? What if you could have a Grammy-winning mix engineer who understood all your mixing struggles and could coach you through them? If you struggle with any of these questions, then the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass is just for you. Now you can discover the proven step-by-step -step mix system from Grammy-winning mixer Craig Alvin for consistently creating a pro-quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. Listen, I appreciate you listening to this podcast, and I know you're trying to make your best record ever. But when you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy-winning quality, then you're ready for UltimateMixingMasterclass.com. Boy, what else? I mean, we're getting near the end here. Um, let me jump into just a couple of these closing questions. Um, uh, you know, our, our typical jam session questions, even though we call the okay. whole second half the jam session. Um, when you started out in recording, what, what was holding you back? What was holding me back? Um, uh, preconceptions. Um, uh, thinking that uh, you know, things need to happen one in a very specific kind of way. It comes, uh, it comes out of you know uh, inexperience, uh, really, uh, and that's what was really holding me back. Thinking that being too precious about things, thinking like things need to happen in a very specific way, that you need to set like a preamp gain in a very specific kind of way, mm -hmm. that you need to EQ in a very specific kind of way, and when you break all of those taboos after a while, then you start enjoying things much more. Yeah. And, and you become much more creative. Very cool. Um, and, you know, that goes back to what you're talking about, working with Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg and artists like that as well. Um, how about some of the best advice you remember receiving? I would say that um, for any up-and-coming, you know, producer, engineer, I would say have very few things in your setup but really dig deep into what they can do for you. Yeah. And really, you know, don't try to incorporate too many new elements into your world and into your setup, but take the time to really dig, like really, really deep. That's where you actually discover like the, you have those holy grail kind of moments where you discover, oh, I can really do this like, that with this specific preset that I just reprogram and then you start like creating your own really useful uh, you know a drawer of tools that, that you can use for for other projects and always you know never be too precious to use things that you discover in one style of music and apply them to other style of music like you were talking about you know mm -hmm. the use of rivers for a jazz project and whatnot. Uh, once in a while, I just go crazy and I start experimenting with other things, even adding, you know, some kind of river that has some kind of uh, underlay layer, you know, distortion to it and in the mids and, and use it for a jazz album too. Why not? It uh, depends on how you can fit it, you know, um, in the song. But yeah, stop. Basically, to me, is to stop being precious, too precious about, you know, how things should be. Yeah. Well, it worked for Miles Davis on a lot of records. Yeah. Break the <laughs> rules. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. How about a, um, a resource or a tip for the business side of doing this? So for those of us who want to do this for more than just a hobby, what advice would you like to share? Or is there, is there some useful tool or resource? I say that you have to be very, very organized or somebody needs to be super organized for you if you are incapable of being being so. So I think that it's very important to be organized, to always respect schedules, delivery, delivery dates, things like that. And in order to uh, be successful at that, you have to be really organized and you need to be honest with your clients about what you can accomplish with a specific budget um, because otherwise uh, it's going to bite your ass in terms of the time required to do things because the time required to do a project uh, it's basically very subjective you're going to do whatever it takes to make it right mm -hmm. that's the reality if it takes 
50 hours, you cannot pretend it's going to take you 10 mm -hmm. to accomplish you know, that result. So you has, have to also be honest with your clients and explain to them why it is going to take longer and why maybe uh, you, know, uh, you need to defend your very specific rate uh, to do that type of project. So I think that's a very good business practice. People don't, uh, can really di disagree with you when you are unable to explain why things take that long or or you or why you need that such a specific type of recording space to to accomplish it mm -hmm. you have to be good at you know uh, at teaching you know uh, other people what it takes yeah and i guess you don't always know what those answers are until you've learned what they are for yourself until you've had the experience exactly it comes with experience too but at the beginning uh, of a career, everybody says, you know, yes to everything by default, right? Mm -hmm. Because you don't want to lose the gig and, and whatnot. But you also have to quickly learn, you know, where the boundaries are. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's go to uh, the, our final closing question. This one is hypothetical. We're going to take the Wayback Studio machine and you get to go back in time and find <laughs> young Rafa, who's uh, maybe doing live sound in Spain, or no, in France, I think, is where you were doing in, it before Spain, school. In Spain and France, yeah. Spain and France, okay, great. And you go back and you, um, you show up uh, and you say, listen, dude, I know this is weird that I'm coming back in time. Don't freak out. But I wanted to tell you this, the single most important thing you need to know to become a rock star of the recording studio yourself one day what, what what advice would you go back and give yourself if you could? Relax. <laughs> Relax. There you go. Relax. Don't do it. Like a, like a Frankie yeah, goes I, to Hollywood. Yes. And I and I know that part of not relaxing was um, in a way an ingredient to my success. And but uh, yeah, you have to yeah, be able to relax a little bit more, um, not be nervous about situations, keep the cool. Uh, specifically that, relax in order to keep the cool in a stressful situations, not to ever worry way too much where you you think you're going to die, you know, in a very stressful situation. Uh, touring was a great school for me because mm -hmm. talking about the stressful situations, uh, Doing live sound uh, is now. It, it, there isn't like, oh, let's try later. No, it's now. It's happening right now. Yeah. The moment that you don't do it, you mi uh, you missed on it. Uh, it really sucked. You know, you didn't do it right. It sucked and you are done. So <laughs> it, it was a great, great school, but you also need to keep it cool. You cannot just jump out, you know, every time something something doesn't go the way it's supposed to or or somebody makes a mistake and it's not even yourself, but somebody else, you have to really be capable of relaxing and keeping the core. Yeah, that's good because, um, you know, inevitably we still got to get the job done. So we still need a solution yeah. and we got to move forward anyway. Yeah. Water absolutely. under the bridge. And also apologies for giving Vance Powell the credit for uh, the, the live sound leads to mixing because I clearly that's exactly what you did too. Yeah, I think that it is too many people, especially if they have been musicians, you know, early on, because <clears throat> that was the clearest path to 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 have the first contact, you know, with engineering and production. That was the first opportunity for all of us, I guess. Well, it was the first opportunity for a lot of uh, the kids coming out of school these days, too, up until this year. So hopefully, um, I'm not sure what the shift is for everybody. It's probably just, um, you know, really focusing on the home studio aspect for now. Yeah. Um, and uh, fingers crossed it will, you know, build it all back again pretty quickly. Yeah, I'm pretty confident that, that it will. I'm Good, I like to hear you that. Know, That's how I feel you about know, it. You uh, know, I'm very optimistic about it. And <clears throat> people uh, are going to have like this... Um, fever for entertainment uh, i think that they already they already have it but yeah. i think that they're really gonna you know put their money where the mouth is and they're gonna go out you know when, when we're able to and they're really gonna you know uh, spend you know their good money on live shows and entertainment and i think it's gonna be super important for the business yeah let's call it what it is it's going to be the greatest party this world has ever seen absolutely <laughs> thanks well, to COVID. 
<laughs> Rafa, thank you so much for joining us on Recording Studio Rockstars. What a great time hanging out with you, man. You're a fantastic storyteller. We really enjoyed um, hearing you talk about all this stuff. Uh, let the Rockstars know where can they go find you online? Where should they go check out your stuff? Uh, if they need to reach out to you to make their next hit record, what should they do? I think that my webpage will be the easiest way, you know, uh, rafasardina.com. Um, that's the centralized way to do it, to reach out to me. And thank you so much. Uh, my pleasure, yeah. man. And, and then Rockstars, of course, a reminder, we've included uh, links to many of the great records that Rafa's worked on, as well as uh, links to his website and everything right in the show notes. So just click right through there. Um, and I don't know if I'm forgetting anything else, but just thank you, man. Thanks for joining us. No, thank you. Uh, it's so great that you are doing this and that you are yeah, putting the world out and sharing so much information with your listeners. Yeah, I love it. Thank well, you it's so easy. Much. All I do is ask you to join me and then I just let you talk. <laughs> <laughs> Guru, man, thanks very much, dude. Thank you. All right, cheers. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my my free course at mixmasterbundle.com and if you want more free content from recording studio rockstars all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email again that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email and i'll keep you in the loop with articles videos podcast updates and even free gear giveaways for your studio just look for the link in the show notes below thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rockstar i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rockstars now go make great music. Recording Studio Rockstars would like to give a big thank you to our amazing sponsors who helped make this episode possible. Sound Porter Mastering, OWC, Adam Audio, Spectra 1964, Isotope, and Jay-Z Microphones. Remember to get your free mastering demo at soundporter.com and use the coupon codes ROCK10 at Isotope for an additional 10% off and ROCKSTARS at jayzmike.com for 50% off the BB29 for a limited time. You'll find links to all these wonderful sponsors in our show notes. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. I would also like to give a big thank you to our rock star team here at Recording Studio Rockstars, Vlad Wesselchenko, Braden Stremming, and Hugh McDonald for additional podcasts and video production. You guys rock. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.